honored uh, to be invited to be involved in this program. Uh, as you know, Ben Lee is one of our residents. He's very much involved in this international uh, area for expanding radiotherapy. And Dr. Gonzalez Moto is, uh, is, is one of my friends, and uh, I consider him one of my mentees. I've been doing radiotherapy a long time, probably before many of you were born. And in the old days, let me just start off, I really have no conflicts. I have consulted in the distant past with Accuray and many drug companies on hormone therapy. I'm not talking about that today, and I do some work at the National Cancer Institute. I'm going to talk about the state of the art of SBRT. Um, some of the topics have been previously discussed, things like the alpha beta ratio and the BED and those sorts of things. I'm not really going to dwell on that kind of information. I understand there have been some discussions about cost effectiveness in the past. You know, is it cheaper to give four or five treatments than 40 treatments? Obviously, four or five would be potentially less expensive. And in some of the population-based studies, some of them suggest that the SVRT might have slightly more side effects. But of course, there's been a learning curve and the technology has gotten better. So um, I think it depends on how it's done. We have prospective studies. We did one called RTOG0938. We compared five fractions versus 12. You have PACE B, you have HypoRT. So fortunately, in the radiotherapy literature, we have a tremendous amount of data to support it. In the latter part of my talk, I'm going to discuss a new study that was published in JAMA this year comparing MR-guided SBRT to what was called CT-guided SBRT. I'll talk about that. Uh, I'm going to mention some work that we're doing with particles. As you know, around the world, people are using protons and some people are using carbon to treat prostate cancer. We've actually designed a study to compare these. We don't have any data, but I think it's interesting to understand what the rationale would be. And then some conclusions. So we have a tremendous number of different kinds of machines that do radiation. When I first started treating prostate cancer, we would take a crayon and a set of orthogonal x-ray images and draw, okay, I want you to radiate this. Then we moved, so I've been doing this over 30 years, and then we moved into the era of using CT where we did 3D conformal, and then we moved to IMRT, and then we moved to um, SBRT. Actually, from IMRT to IGRT, image-guided radiation. The bottom line is, in order to treat the prostate, you need to know where it is, and you need to understand the anatomy. I mean, knowing where it is just before you treat and knowing at the, and understanding the anatomy are key to doing it properly. So when you write a prescription to a patient and you say, this is your plan, that is a dose distribution, which is either on a piece of paper or in a computer. It is a promise to the patient that that is what is going to happen to you. And so you have to make some assumptions about the motion that's going to occur, about setup error, about the margins, about day-to-day -day variability. And you have to understand what the literature says about what's safe and also what is logical. The first recognition that this was a real problem goes back 30 years ago. A physicist at the University of Michigan named Randy Tenhocken wrote some of the first papers where they did CTs repeatedly and showed that the prostate position is variable. Prior to that, we used to just put a tattoo on the patient's exterior body and assume that the prostate was in the same place every day. Now, the problem with Randy Tenhocken's paper is that we didn't have anything that we could do about it. We could do a CT on one day and show the prostate was one place and do it the next day and show it was somewhere else, but we didn't have a solution to address the problem, so we sort of ignored the problem. One thing we tried to do was to look at whether changing the margins around the prostate could be helpful. 
So rather than, uh, and I'll come back to this when I talk about the MR versus CT study published in JAMA. In that study, they chose two millimeter margins versus four millimeter margins. And what we discussed 30 years ago was that it doesn't make sense to have the margins the same everywhere around. You could, you could reduce the complication probability by having tighter margins near the rectum, near dose limiting structures, and make sure that you have more generous margins laterally and anteriorly to adjust for antipost movement because if the prostate moves anteriorly, then your posterior margin is not gonna get a lot, it's not gonna become a problem. If it moves back and forth, at least you won't overtreat the rectum. And what we recommended again 30 years ago was to simulate the patient with the rectum empty and the bladder full. And that way the prostate would be in the most posterior inferior position. And if there's movement anteriorly, you would increase the margin. You wouldn't underdose it, but you wouldn't overdose the rectum. And after that, 10 years later, um, people showed from MD Anderson, a very elegant study, showed that if the patient was simulated at the time of simulation, if they were simulated with their rectum distended, um, they had a lower complication rate, but they had a higher biochemical failure rate. So you can see the distended rectal patients had more recurrences. And that's because if the rectum was full, when the simulation occurred, when the rectum became empty, the prostate would move posteriorly and you would underdose part of the prostate. So it's important to be systematic about how you simulate patients when you radiate them. And this becomes particularly important as you use smaller and smaller margins. Now, what, oh, there's a hand raised. I don't know if we wanna, can I, someone raised a hand. Should I give them a chance to chat or what we're doing here? I, I think, Yes, give me a second. I will open his, give me one second. I will open his microphone. Just Frank, eh, bienvenido, adelante. Ya puedes activar tu micrófono. Puedes hacer la pregunta. Frank, I don't Frank? hear him, so I don't know if someone else does. I, I can hear you, but I don't know. Frank is not. Now. Continue, Dr. Roach. Okay, all right, I'll continue. Maybe he wants, maybe he put a question in chat that he would prefer that I read the question and respond to it. Let me see if I see anything. I don't see it. Well, if you get the question later, feel free, because I, I like, I like real-time questions. Anyway, about 20 years ago or so, uh, this is, these are images from the so-called BAT. This is a B-mode ultrasound system, and this was very popular at the time. People would use an ultrasound to align the prostate every day before treatment. And everybody was buying these machines, and everybody was raving about how accurate it was. In fact, at the plenary session at Astro, speakers were up there going, yeah, this is what we do. Well, during that same session, we had a poster but we compared the BAT versus using fiducial implanted markers. And what we found was that there was tremendous inter-observer variability uh, between, we had uh, four radiation oncologists, we had a urologist, we had therapists, we had physicists, and there was a considerable amount of inter-observer variability. And the point here is that this is uh, right to left and whether this is basically a metric for how the alignment was. And you can see the pictures are fairly fuzzy. So it's much more accurate for people to identify a point in space than it is for them to identify a fuzzy image. And in fact, uh, subsequently, this slide was not um, in the set that I sent in earlier, but I added it this morning. This is a study done by Pat Capellian uh, many years ago, looking at when uh, tomotherapy first became available, 
looking at whether you could use tomotherapy in lieu of using fiducial markers and suggested that things that you had less error if you use fiducial markers. So one of the challenges to doing SBRT is how do you localize the beam? Can you just use cone beam CT? And I don't think cone beam CT is accurate enough for a couple of reasons. One is the inter-observer variability that's not going to be as good as the seeds and the variability on the quality of the images that you're going to get with cone beam CT. So going back uh, many years, uh, our first electronic portal imaging system was clunky. But as soon as we, and now it's been incorporated, this is, this is many years ago, but uh, we started using these gold seeds as soon as we, and this has been more than 20 years now, uh, using these implanted markers, and they weren't expensive. Uh, the seeds cost about two cents a piece, 24 karat gold. You would have them, we had them implanted by the urologist, and then we get a set of orthogonal images, and then we can uh, superimpose digitally reconstructed radiographs, and the treatments can be delivered within a couple of millimeters, one to two millimeters, and the treatment can be delivered quickly. This is a very old image. The patient was, was you can see the seeds, the images of quality was very poor in those days. Now it's very precise. And then you reposition the patient in both in the orthogonal images to get the digitally reconstructed radiograph with the seeds that are seen today and the patient is precisely aligned. And when we implemented our, this is from a review article we wrote on SBRT, what we do is we do CT and we do MR and then we co-register the CT and the MR and then we line up, in this case, this is using a, a cyber knife, but you can use a LINAC as well. This is hundreds of beams and the patient is very precisely aligned. So many people assume that, you know, IMRT is the same and, you know, the because the alpha beta ratio is similar, IMRT and protons are about the same and uh, permanent implants are, but these are all different forms of, of radiation. And I should put SBRT rather than a brand, but these are all different forms. But we know that the delivery time is much shorter with, with SBRT. There's no need for anesthesia. And the point is that it has to be done very accurately and you need to understand the anatomy. When you compare the dose distribution, looking at HDR versus SBRT. This is looking at volumes to the rectum. You can make them basically virtually identical. And uh, we did some early work verifying that. The, so we've used this in lieu of, of HDR. So we have a number of people at my institution who do HDR brachytherapy, and I don't do brachytherapy anymore, but it's less invasive, less anesthesia. Dr. Roach, less... uh -huh. Dr. Roach we have a question. Okay. Someone is asking, what do you think about the displacement of the seeds? After you implant the seeds, what do you think about the displacement of the seeds? So if the seeds are implanted in the prostate tissue, in the parenchyma, they basically don't move. The problem is if you get them in the seminal vesicles, if you get them in a vessel, if you get them around the prostate in veins, if you get them outside the prostate. The same thing is when you do brachytherapy. When you do a brachytherapy implant, if you get them in the lymphatics or in a vein, it can go. I had one patient that had a seed that went to their heart. But if you put it in the meat of the prostate, and we have them put the seeds at the apex, the mid gland, and the base, particularly when you use a cyber knife, they have to be a certain distance apart. So they have to, and they need to be in a different plane. But if they're in the meat of the prostate uh, and we put them in a few days before, then they basically uh, don't move, uh, which is one reason why I like to have urologists who have experience putting seeds in to put the seeds in. Before we started, I made the point that one of the most important things about managing patients is man also managing your referring physician, managing the urologist. You need to have conversations with them about, are you gonna use hormone therapy? Are you not gonna use hormone therapy? They need gold seeds. I prefer to let the urologist do it 
but to keep them involved. So I think they're better suited. But if, if you don't have a urologist doing it, then do it yourself. I think Alejandro puts his own seeds in, but I don't put in mine. Someone uh -huh. also is asking about doing SBRT without seeds. I've never, the only time I do SBRT without seeds is if the patient has massive disease, which is not moving. And their medical circumstances make it challenging to get seeds. It's semi-palliative. And uh, I'm going to treat them on a LENAC because it's faster. But otherwise, there's no way that you can be as precise without seeds. And I think that we go to a lot of trouble to go from conventional radiation to 3D to IMRT and then the SBRT. And um, even if you use seeds, you're going to get complications, but you want to minimize the risk of complications. And if you absolutely cannot get them, you know, you, um, I think hypofractionation may be a little bit safer, you know, but I basically always use seeds unless there's some extenuating circumstances. So I don't recommend it, but I'll talk, I, I mentioned earlier the paper by Dr. Capellian going back many more than 20 years ago when, when tomotherapy first became available and they were thinking, well, maybe we don't need to use seeds, but they found that they actually had better and more accurate alignment if they use seeds rather than comb beam CT alone. So I don't think comb beam CT is adequate, but there's, this is one of the many papers Dr. Kishan and others have put together documenting the efficacy of, uh, SBRT and low risk and intermediate risk patients. There have been uh, at least two meta analyses, formal meta analysis. This is this is from 2019, stereotactic body radio, the systematic review and meta analysis. This one supports the value of SBRT. This is another one with more than 6,000 patients, again from 2019, showing excellent control rates and uh, relatively low toxicity profile. In fact, the toxicity profile suggested in some of these reports is so favorable that one wonders why anybody would even consider trying to put spacer material or do other interventions, but uh, that's become very popular, and I'll talk about that a bit later. We do know that the fractionation that's being used is variable. Um, the most common is 725 times five in the US. That may be partly due to the fact that in the United States, the reimbursement for SBRT is structured so that you can do up to five treatments. And so it's a lot of people want to give five treatments. My standard for a patient who has favorable anatomy is four treatments. I do 950 times four and it, it, you know, if anything, there's a slight trend for a better control. It is, does have a higher BED. It's more convenient for the patient. So I can treat a patient Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and be done, or treat them Thursday, Friday, give them the weekend off, and then treat them Monday, Tuesday, and be done. So if you have a patient who's traveling from out of town, they don't have to spend more than a week. If you go with five treatments, most people use every other day. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday. That means they've got to be around for nearly two weeks as opposed to one week. So I like 950 times four. When I use it as a boost, I'll talk about this later. I like a reverse boost. I do 950 times two, and then I do pelvic radiation for higher risk and unfavorable intermediate risk patients. If we look at uh, some of the studies that have been published, I'm not going to go over all of them. The PACE B study is one, the early report from 2019 compared conventional dose escalated external IMRT versus SBRT. And you could see that the toxicity profile was very similar. Um, but one of the observations they made is that they stratified based on. Uh, whether or not the SBRT was given with a cyber knife or whether it was not given with a cyber knife. So they noticed that um, 
if you look at GI greater than or equal to grade two, the non-cyber knife was 11% versus 9%, which wasn't different. But if you look at GU toxicity versus GI, it was 31 versus 12, suggesting that uh, the toxicity was a little bit higher, was statistically higher with the non-cyber knife use. And so the problem was this was not a randomization variable. This was a stratification. So they then looked at, well, what about the patients who were at a center that did not have a cyber knife? How did their IMRT patients do compared to the IMRT patients from the CyberKnife institution? The point is maybe it was due to the doctors and the institution and their experience. And the bottom line is that they did not see a difference in the IMRT part. So it suggested that maybe this was a legitimate observation that maybe the toxicity was slightly lower in the site with the cyber knife patients. Now, more recently in 2022, Allison Tree, also part of that group, did an update looking at the two year toxicity. And uh, I, I sent her an email asking her about the status of this. And again, it shows that if you look at the cyber knife, the good is the dark green. So you can see it at 24 months, you have a taller dark green line with cyber knife versus LENAC based, and you have fewer of the orange color uh, of patients with the, with the cyber knife. But she said the PACE B toxicity was significantly less with cyber knife for GU, but this was confounded by the fact that cyber knife centers were early SBRT adopters and mostly high volume academic centers. And she gave me the reference and so forth. So the bottom line is we don't know whether uh, doing cyber knife is better or not. There could be biases, but it is an observation that was made in the uh, Pace Beast trial. Now, in the United States, what's become very popular is to use this so-called hydrogel, hydrogel spacer material. And this was the study that resulted in FDA approval. And what and they concluded that the spacer was well tolerated, increased perirectal space reduction, uh, reduced rectal ir uh, irradiation, reduced rectal toxicity, and it appears to be an effective tool enabling advanced prostate RT protocols. And what I've done is you notice I have these red lines below. This shows that NM, who was the first author, and the third author were both stockholders in the company. And uh, the statistics were done by an employee of the company. So whenever I see that, that automatically creates a certain amount of skepticism on my part. I believe there's a conflict. And there's this phenomena that we talk about, the placebo effect, right? This is because this was an unblinded study that this that resulted in FDA approval. The way the study was designed, the patients were supposedly not told. At the time of placement of the fiducial markers, they either did or did not have the gel material placed. Now, of course, the doctors knew, and in this case, the doctors were in some places consultants on speaking uh, things or, or had stock in the company. This University of Cincinnati study tested blue and pink stimulants and sedatives on students. Unbeknownst to the students, both the stimulants and the sedatives were placebo. So they had no activity. There was nothing in it. The only difference was some pills were blue and some pills were pink. The blue sedatives were 66% effective compared with 26% for the pink pills. So blue pills were and two and a half times more effective for relaxation than the pink pills. So merely the fact that somebody looks at a pill can create bias. And so if you you have a so when I ask my patients who have had spacer, did you know you had spacer? The patients would say, "Yes, I felt like I was sitting on a ping pong ball." 
So if the patient knows that they got the spacer, then they know that they should have less side effects because that was the whole point of putting in the spacer. And the doctors who put it in there know they got the spacer and are biased to believe they should expect less in the way of side effects. And I like to throw in a quote every now and then, it's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. So when you believe something to be true and it's not, that can be a problem. So if you look at the bottom line from this trial regarding the primary safety endpoint, the rate of grade one or greater rectal or procedural adverse events in the first six months were 34.2% versus 31.5% for the spacer and control groups. Well, the whole point of putting the spacer in there is to reduce the side effects of radiation but it did not affect the side effects of radiation during the treatment. And of course, there was some discomfort associated with the space replacement of 10% in the patients that got the spacer. And if you look at the acute toxicity, so this is through the first three months, they were not statistically different, but it was between the third month and the 15th month, which doesn't really make sense to me, but if you look at the difference, you see grade one and greater than grade one, you can see that the absolute difference of grade one or higher toxicity with or without the spacer was 5%. So even though they put these spacers in all these people, there was a potential reduction in grade one toxicity, which I've never seen in any other study, even study grade one toxicity, uh, which was statistically significant. Now, if you look at the rectal toxicity, you can see on the top, you see the cumulative incidence and you see a small difference reported out at you know 15 months or whatever. But if you look at urinary side effects, the urinary side effects were actually more impressive than the rectal side effects, but there was no difference in the dosimetry for the bladder and no, no differences found in the hot spots in the PTV. So how can you explain less, uh, a more impressive effect on bladder and less yeah. than on rectum? And I would argue that it's the, the, you have a very subjective endpoint, grade one toxicity, which is mild clinical or diagnostic observations only, intervention not included, and the opportunity for the placebo effect. The placebo effect, you know, when the when you go to the patient, you say, Mr. Jones, it's been a year since you had, or it's been, you know, six months since you had your radiation. How are you doing? And he goes, I'm doing fine, doc. The side effects, the side effects can be quite low. I think the placebo effect there. Now, this is from an updated, this came from the AUA, the American Urologic Association meeting in Chicago. I was a moderator on this session. Uh, and we've subsequently published an, a, a commentary in Lancet, but this, is, this was just presented. This is looking at post-market surveillance in patients in Australia, looking at the rates of rectal wall infiltration. They did an audit between 2017 and 2021 and they were looking at MRIs to look at rectal wall infiltration at the time of the space replacement. So they had 87 patients, 41% had rectal wall infiltration, 23% were grade one, 10% grade two, and 8% grade three. Three patients had significant rectal complications. One patient had a rectal urethral fistula. All cases, that had grade, the ones that had the most significant were the ones that had rectal wall invasion. But GI symptoms were not a predictor of rectal wall invasion. So you couldn't say, how do you, you okay? Oh, Mr. Jones, you're having a rectal problem. Let me check your rectal wall. No, they actually did not see a relationship. So they recommend that, that all patients have an MRI after 
just to make sure that if they have rectal wall invasion, you don't want to start radiating them. If, they have, if they're inclined toward getting a complication, you may want to wait for it to resolve. The bottom line is I don't recommend using spacer. And in the original study, it was in low risk and favorable intermediate risk patient, certainly for high risk patients who are at risk for extra capsular extension. You don't want to be putting a whole lot of foreign material uh, in an area that might uh, have be contaminated by extra capsular extension. Now, this is from an article that Dr. Gonzalez Mota and I published in Practical Radiation Oncology. This was a survey looking at biochemical control where you use SBRT monotherapy or as a boost. Uh, bottom line, I see it's a busy slide. The point is that the results are similar with HDR. And if you look at PSA nadir, you can see that if you look at SBRT boost, it's right down here with HDR boost. And if you look at the side effect profile, SBRT is the round orange dot. It's in the ballpark of what you see with the HDR. So we expect similar uh, levels of toxicity uh, with, with it. And at UCSF, we use it both as monotherapy. The technique that we developed, our fractionation was developed based on our experience with HDR. We had many years experience with HDR uh, brachytherapy. So we figure that if you give 950 times four as monotherapy, you could use 950 times four with SBRT like you did with HDR. And the same thing is at a boost. And we set similar sorts of dose constraints the most important, which is to keep the urethral dose less than 120% of the prescription dose, which, which turns out to be less than 47 gray if you're doing 950 times four. Now, this is a very busy slide. This slide is designed from a book chapter that we wrote like, how do you decide what you're going to do? And, you know, in pre, prior to 1996, we did IG, IGRT. We did a lot of permanent implants. We did HDR. And more recently, I'm doing more um, SBRT. So I would focus on the last column, the last row, rather. You can use this for monotherapy for lower favorable patients. You can use it as a boost for higher risk patients. We use it for salvage in cases where we don't wanna do salvage brachytherapy. In patients who present with obstruction due to locally advanced disease, I, I prefer to use this. If it's due to tumor, SBRT is my preferred approach. If it's due to underlying BPH, a benign condition, then I don't favor uh, SBRT. I tend to avoid large median lobes. I have treated patients with large median lobes in those patients, I skimp on the, usually the median lobe is not involved by tumor, so I may not cover it because it increases the bladder dose, uh, or I'm just tight on the median lobe. If a patient is unable to lie flat, that is, they have a tremor and they can't, they're moving all the time, they will not be a good uh, patient, at least for CyberNight, because it, delivery time is slower. If they have uh, metal hips, that make it impossible to see their anatomy. If their seeds are, if they don't have seeds, I tend not to use it. So, and if they have large terp defects, and I will use it for patients with large terp defects in some cases, but in general, patients that have large terp defects tend to have more bleeding long-term when you do dose escalated radiation. In the HypoRT study, which was a, uh, a seven fractions versus 39 fractions, their results were very similar to the results of PACE B with control and toxicity. Again, this is the toxicity data again, showing similar results. In our trial, 0938, where we compared five fractions versus 12 fractions, we saw similar control rates and similar rates of toxicity. This is the toxicity data basically superimposable. So you can do this. You can give people four or five fractions safely as long as you do it at least the way that it was described in some of these studies. This is from a paper that uh, William Chen and I published in the Red Journal uh, a couple of years, within the last couple of years. You're looking at 
comparing. This is our retrospective comparison of SBRT with a boost in two fractions, 950 times two or, or, or 21 gray in two fractions. And we compared it against our HDR patients. We matched them. Uh, we have, you know, we, these are the characteristics of the patients. And then we did propensity matching. This is uh, a matching. Uh, this is showing uh, SBRT versus HDR, similar to biochemical control and metastasis-free survival. So I use it in lieu of uh, HDR. It's more versatile. Uh, so here's the first question. Which of the following statements is false? The transabdominal ultrasound approach called a BAT was shown to, to be subject to significant interobserved variability and subsequently largely abandoned. Rectal distension at the time of at the time of the simulation has been shown to be associated with less toxicity. Do, Dr. Least, Roach, just, uh -huh. just to just to let you know, I just uh -huh. the, the question. You can continue reading, but Everyone can also eh, check the Zoom pool. To todos pueden adelante ir contestando eh, la, la pregunta que consideren mientras eh, el Dr. Roach continúa la lectura. Go, go ahead, Dr. Okay. Roach. Okay, okay. So, so everybody can read. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, true, that's true. Right. Yeah. Then All right, can so read for the results, and then right. Then you so can come so we have we have trials, and we have and and number five rectal space has been proven to reduce the toxicity. So which of these is true? I don't know if you want to get the results before we end the poll. Okay, yeah, yeah. Wait a little bit. Maybe we are going to expect a little bit more participants, and then stop the question. Okay. Adelante, por favor. Todos pueden marcar. Yeah, we have up to thirty-one percent. We're still getting there. People are shy. Which of these is false? It looks like right now rectal distension is winning out. Let's see. Maybe 10 seconds more. We're up to 40%. If we get cut, if we get 50%, that'd be great. Yeah, can yeah. We get, <laughs> can we get a few more? We're getting we're 41%. All right. Well, I think we're slowing down. I think we should call it. The correct answer is actually number five. Okay. Rectal spacer has not been proven to reduce the toxicity of SBRT. The randomized trial that was published was with IM, conventional external vein radiation. All of the other ones are true. It's true that the BAT system was abandoned. Rectal distension was associated with less toxicity. If at the time the rectum was distended, when the patients got treated, it was associated with less toxicity. And there have been, and uh, yes, there are at least two systematic reviews that have been shown to, to uh, that, that show that SBRT is very safe and effective or supported. So regarding the art of radiotherapy, data from phase three trials should drive our management of patients but there are severe limitations. Number one, there's only a limited number of studies. And number two, there's heterogeneity in terms of the disease. You've got low risk, intermediate risk, and intermediate risk, you've got favorable and unfavorable. And then you have limited eligibility. You have the prostate, if the patient has certain age factors and so forth. There's also a limited number of things you can do. You can vary the dose. You can, of radiation, you can vary the volume of radiation, and you can vary whether you give hormone therapy or not. And sometimes that doesn't help you answer the questions you want to know. So unusual cases I find useful, and I've talked about some of these cases in the past. You may have seen these in other talks. Dr. Lee raised his hand. Uh, you want to, Ben, you got a question? Go, go ahead, Ben. Ow. Give me a second. I think we need to. Yes. Hey, good morning. So Hi. Dr. Roach, let's, let's go back a second and talk about the answer to the last question, because I think a lot of people were surprised that rectal distension has not been shown to be associated with more toxicity and that in, instead the rectal spacer was was the thing that well, I showed. So yeah. I showed a slide. This is the study from the very beginning of my talk. 
Actually, first I showed this slide, which was how we simulate our patients with the rectum empty and the bladder full 30 years ago, because we assumed that this would be the best way to do it. And then 10 years later, the study from MD Anderson, where they looked at how distended was the rectum during the, the simulation and patients that had a distended rectum. And I made the point, I didn't show the curve, that patients that had a distended rectum had less side effects. And that's because once you start radiating the patient, the rectum becomes empty and the prostate moves posteriorly and you tend to miss the anterior wall of the rectum. Because the beam here, the patients were set up based on their tattoos. So if the tattoo is set right here in the middle of the prostate, and then the rectum becomes empty, the prostate moves back and you're not actually radiating the anterior wall of the rectum anymore. And this actually will come up again in one of the other questions that I have subsequently. And if you talk about, and if you go to the, the uh, trial from uh, on the SPACER, the SPACER trial was for, this is for patients treated with, they were treated with image-guided IMRT. They did not get SBRT. Now, there are many people who have done SPACER in patients that have had SBRT, and they claim it is well-tolerated. But if you go back to the... Um, the systematic reviews and meta-analyses that have been published, and you look at the, let me see, for example, the study that, you know, that we pulled with, the, that Alejandra and I published, the fact that it matters, and I'm not finding it at the moment, the rectal complication rate was already low. Here we go. And if you look at the 6,000 patient study, the more common thing, the GU, you're looking at one or 2% that had grade, that had significant grade. So this is with grade three GU. It's so low to start out with that when you see a study where they say, we took everybody who came in for SBRT and we put a spacer in, look how well they did. Well, none of these people had spacer material. And look at late GI, late GU, it's very low. So the they don't, there are no randomized trials that prove that the space or uh, material is associated with a better outcome. I see. So yeah. I mean, this is good. We're getting some questions in the chat. I think people are well, starting to think about their beliefs. But let's just make sure we're well, if someone uh, else has a question, they I'm I'm quite willing and enthusiastic about an exchange of, of ideas, but uh, so let's not uh, slow the, the ebb and the flow of questions. So is there a question that someone else wishes to ask? I think we, we have another one from okay. Alejandro Blanco from Costa Rica. He asks, okay. nowadays, is some generic platform to help us take in decision about doses, volume, and when to treat? Genetic assays? Genetic platform. Yeah, so that's that's a very good question, a very complicated question. There are, there's a paper published by Kishan uh, looking at biomarkers that predict toxicity. And I've actually sent some patients with biomarker studies. This is not ready for prime time. It's being studied. These are so-called SNPs single nucleotide polymorphisms that can be used to correlate. They predict sometimes with radi enhanced radiation sensitivity, which can change into, into toxicity. But, and then there we have data, there's some data from the RTOG looking at dose escalation, suggesting that we have some artificial intelligence data using AI that could help determine which patients would benefit from hormone therapy. And there's some data using uh, other genetic markers like Decipher to look at subsets of patients that were treated with dose escalation. But none of those are have been used in this exact setting. It's not really SBRT, it's radiation in general. 
So we don't have uh, comparable data that, that I'm aware of. Well, we don't have it that shows that we would, I mean, and of course you might speculate that it would be relevant, but we, we don't have really good data on that. Thank you, Dr. So, Rose. Okay. So my, this is how I treat patients with high-risk prostate cancer. I use SBRT in lieu of HDR. I do the SBRT first, or I call it reverse boost SBRT followed by whole pelvic radiation. It's less traumatic to the gland. It makes it easier for me to coordinate their referral. Sometimes the patient's coming from great distance. It's easier for me to do the SBRT first. I also can do it with a single MR and CT. If you do the SBRT last, if you do the five pelvic radiation first, you do a CT planning for the pelvic radiation, and then you have to do a CT again in order to do CT MR fusion for the SBRT. But if you do the MR SBRT CT planning first and then finish the SBRT, I don't do another CT scan. You see the anatomy better when you do the MR. So having done the MR first allows you to make sure that you are confident in your anatomy. There's a randomized trial from, from Wayne State that was run by a, a radiation oncologist, famous, excellent guy who's no longer with us named Jeff Foreman, did a randomized trial of neutrons first versus neutrons second, and turned out that doing the boost first resulted in better biochemical control. There's evidence that treating the prostate itself, especially with SBRT, may stimulate the immune response. Pelvic radiation tends to suppress the immune response. I like to stimulate the immune response first and uh, try to avoid suppressing the immune response. If you do a reverse boost, what happens is you've designed the SBRT plan and then you can design the pelvic plan and then you can create a composite plan and you can make sure that you don't have a hot spot in normal tissues around the prostate. If you do the pelvic radiation first and then subsequently try to do the SBRT, the SBRT is less flexible and you may end up with a hot spot in surrounding tissues that you can't fix. It's easier to prevent that if you do a composite plan first. And then I have this anecdotal experience in patients who have presented with obstruction due to high volume disease. And I've seen them resolve the instruction more obstruction more quickly than I did with conventional fractionation. So these are my reasons. I call this robust RT. Uh, this is reverse boost SBRT. And here's a here's a one of my residents. There was a palliative care meeting, and she uh, so I had her write up our experience with a, with a handful of patients who presented with obstruction. So these are three patients. The first three patients, they all had T3, T4 disease. They had high grade tumors. They had they had been on hormone therapy. It didn't help. One was monotherapy. The other two were as a reverse boost, and. Time from RT completion to Foley removal. When we completed the RT, they, this person became catheter free. This is four weeks later. This is two weeks later. They never got recatheterized. So, so I so, like this. Uh, sorry, before we, go for, before we go for cases, we have some questions still about this and I will summary them. Okay. So, are still having doubts about the rectal distension. So someone is asking, Tomana Peña is asking about rectal distension is difficult to reproduce every day. Also, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. So we don't want rectal distension. Yeah. We want the rectum empty. The whole thing about the rectal extension was it was a post hoc retrospective analysis, which found that some patients, when they were simulated, they happened to have a distended rectum. So if I see a patient and I'm doing simulation and their rectum is distended, I stop the simulation and either send them to get an enema 
or uh, in some cases, if the patient is on the table having SBRT, I will put a tube, a red robin or a catheter in the rectum and let the gas out to empty the rectum in order to make it reproducible because we don't do a plan when the patient has the distended rectum because they're not going to have a distended rectum every day. So of course you don't wanna have a distended rectum. The point of the paper from MD Anderson was that be careful with patients who have a distended rectum because they have a higher recurrence rate. Subsequently, because the prostate moved in, and actually, let me just, you see this slide here? This is from a patient I'm gonna talk about next, but if you look at his rectum, there's a nodule right between his bladder and his rectum. This is a recurrence. This is an oligometastasis, probably to a perirectal node or a pelvic node. And then we did another test uh, and the, the nodule had moved. So things can move. But the point is that the rectal filling is gonna be variable from time to time. So I agree with the person who's raising the question. Yes, of course, rectal filling is not a reliable thing that you can get. You don't want it at all. So I don't know if that answered the question. Maybe they can see yeah. if that answered the question. Thank you, Dr. Roche. I think that finished the, the, because some people in the audience was asking a little bit questions, but I think now all of us have clear, we want the rectum empty. That's yes, it. we want the rectum empty. Now, if you're using a balloon in the rectum, like some people when they do proton radiation, because they did not have online imaging and because particles are less forgiving, when you use particles, either protons or carbon, it's even more of a problem than it is with x-rays because those types of radiation are perturbed by bone more than x-rays. So in order to avoid that, they put a balloon in the rectum every day for every treatment. But I don't do that. I don't like that idea. But anyway, okay, so this is, a and the point of this patient is not really treating the prostate with SBRT. This is treating an oligometastasis. This was a patient who was treated on a dose escalation study 20 years ago. And we treated him to 79.2, and his PSA that started out was 10. So he had intermediate risk disease based on PSA. And his PSA nadir was only 0.92, which is a pretty high nadir. And it subsequently rose. And we couldn't figure out what was going on. We would do scans. We didn't have PSMA PET in those days. And we, then we biopsied him. And, and then eventually, like... Maybe eight years after he was initially treated, we did a CT, which showed a 1.1 centimeter nodule superior to his seminal vesicles. And we had that thing biopsied. And there was a Gleason 4 plus 4 present in extra prostatic tissue. So, we, so when we simulated, we noticed that even though these slices are pretty comparable, you can see the nodule here, but you don't see it there. That's because it's mobile. So I had my urologist stick a gold marker seed in that nodule, and I treated it. I radiated only his pelvic nodes, and I boosted that nodule to nine to six fifty times four, and gave him two years of hormone therapy. And he stopped uh, his treatment back in two thousand and sixteen. And his and his PSA is. And I spoke to him a year ago now and he still is controlled and so the point here is that even patients with isolated oligometastatic disease may benefit from sbrt but and this is a highly selected patient and i did treat his entire pelvis but i boosted the nodule so regarding lessons learned follow patients particularly if their psa response is suboptimal and, uh, you know, nowadays you can get a PET scan. It probably would have picked this up a little bit earlier. But if you don't treat for cure, you won't cure those you treat. And it's important to manage motion and know where your target is. This is another case. 
This is a patient that had a high grade tumor, at least in four plus five. He was a he had seminal vesicle involvement. His PSA was relatively low. There are studies that show that a low PSA is bad when you have a high grade tumor and a high stage tumor. But in any event, he had extensive disease and I treated and he was obstructed. I treated him with a reverse boost and subsequent, I'm going to just, I'm sort of going through it very quickly. He was long follow-up. He, we did, we did biopsies and eventually, again, I'm just going to zip right through it. He actually uh, is, is out more than 10 years off hormone therapy. PSA is undetectable. Testosterone is normal. He actually resumed, he took testosterone because of the bone density problems. But the point is that even patients, this is a patient that had like 12 out of 15 cores positive of high grade disease, who's more than 10 years out with a normal testosterone and an undetectable PSA with a negative biopsy. So I'm not going to spend any time on this. This is the study that I've launched. I just wrote a grant to compare carbon versus protons versus photon SBRT. If we get funded, we will do this international randomized trial, but it is an area of interest and I'm going to skip through it because it's a little bit um, off topic. I just want to make the point that sometimes when I take patients that I want to give hormone therapy to, this is from my randomized trial 9413. If you focus only on the patients that have prostate only radiation, there are two groups, neoadjuvant and prostate only, which is the red or prostate only and adjuvant, which is back here, the bot, which is the black line. The bottom line is that if when I only radiate the prostate, I give the hormone therapy after the radiation, not before the radiation. And I just give four months. Now I'm going to talk about this, what I consider to be a very controversial paper published in JAMA Oncology. So this, the title of this study is uh, Magnetic Resonance Imaging Guided versus CT Guided Stereotactic Body Radiotherapy for Prostate Cancer. And actually, I don't even like the title. Uh, I don't think that the radiation is guided by the CT. I don't think it's CT guided. It's radiation guided by fiducial markers. And in both cases, the patients had their planning target volume designed using a three Tesla MRI. So the MR, so the anatomy was precisely defined. And at the time of treatment, the patients that were treated with the MRI on an MRI LINAC, they localized the prostate without markers using the MRI machine. And the patients that were on the, the, the LINAX they use the fiducial marker. So this is a fiducial marker guided versus MRI guided. Okay, the primary objective was to uh, improve acute physician score GU toxicity when compared uh, with MRI compared to CT guided SBRT. And acute toxicity was assessed by CTCAE version four, and see, so first of all, I don't think that it's a good idea to have a primary endpoint of any study based on physician score toxicity. I believe at least the primary endpoint needs to be patient reported toxicity. And here, the randomization was SBRT with CT guidance or MR guidance is what they say. But the difference was for CT guidance, they used a four millimeter margin. And for MR guidance, they used a two millimeter margin. And the dose they gave was 40 gray in five fractions. And they stopped the study early. They reported that there was that the grade two GU was 24 versus 43%. And the incidence of uh, greater than grade two GI was zero versus 10.5%. They also reported some patient uh, numbers in terms of urinary score. They actually suggested that there were some differences in the patient reported part. So they did a physician reported part that was the primary 
uh, out uh, endpoint and the patient, which is a secondary endpoint. And their conclusion was that MR was better. And the question is, is that true? And I'm not convinced. So this was the randomized trial. They had a hundred, they had uh, ended up with 70, 77 versus 79 patients. And first of all, I love defining the prostate on MR versus CT. This is from this is the first paper, which I wrote back in 1996, that compared MRI prostates versus CT prostates. And we showed that the prostate appeared to be 32% larger on CT than MRI. So yes, it's very good to use the MRI to define the prostate specifically when you do an SBRT. Uh, on the other hand, we also did a study, and I talked about this earlier, where we looked at using ultrasound images and not using fiducial markers. And what we found was that there was significant inter-observer variability using ultrasound images. To my knowledge, the investigators have not studied the inter-observer variability of using a 0 0.35 Tesla machine. We're not talking about the diagnostic MRI machines that we use, like the 1.5 and the 3. We're talking about a 0 0.35 machine without markers. We know CT without markers is not as good as with markers, and we know ultrasound was not as good as the markers, but we haven't that, but they don't, they have not verified, to my knowledge, that MRI has the reproducibility of the markers, fiducials. So this is a comparison of fiducial guidance versus MR guidance. And the question is, is it adequate? Now, the other thing to keep in mind, what they're arguing is also that because they're doing real-time monitoring with the MR, that they can adjust for the prostate position. But the automatic beam hold adjustment was only initiated if greater than 10% of the prostate volume was outside a three millimeter gating boundary. So they claim that they had implemented a process that if, if greater than 10% of the prostate volume was outside, then they would make an adjustment. So this MRI guidance is not rigorous one or two millimeter guidance necessarily. We don't know the reproducibility, but it had to be greater than 10% of the prostate volume to initiate the uh, adjustment. So I want you all to do a thought experiment with me. Suppose you had two identical machines and you're doing a randomized trial of two millimeter margins versus four millimeter margins. And this is the volume. These are the volumes that they reported were irradiated. 70.55 versus 102.1. Okay, so you might expect that if you put four, four millimeters versus a two, that you would have more complications. But then again, you cannot argue that this technology is, is inferior to the one that used the two millimeter margin because these are identical technologies that the difference in the side effects are different are due to the volume of tissue that you radiated, not the technology. And the decision about whether you use two millimeters margins or four millimeter margins is a little bit arbitrary. Now this is taking the example further. Let's say, okay, in this case, I have two different MR machines. Same issue, this MR machine, this MR machine, again, it's not due to the type of machine, it's due to the volume that's radiated. So when we go to MR versus CT, we have a higher volume radiated, but we also have a larger treatment delivery time. And I just got a message that my computer battery is running out. One second, I'm gonna pause there for a second. Vamos a hacer una pausa un momento eh, en espera de, del Dr. Roach y cuando ya regrese de esta parte, vamos a hacer las otras. Anyway, I'll keep talking.
So <laughs> the delivery time, so the need to adapt when you do adaptive IMRT is dependent upon how long you are treating. If you, if the, the longer the patient is on the table, the more likely it is to move. All right, that should take care of. All right, so the treatment time with the MR, yes, it's plugged in, okay. The treatment time with the, with the, oops, okay. The treatment time with the MR was 1133 seconds compared to 232 seconds. So even though the MR was supposed to be able to make adjustments, it took longer, so there was more time for motion in the prostate to occur than it was with the CT. It was delivered more quickly. And again, uh, there are questions about how accurate this can be done. But that's not the only problem. First of all, the decision to use 40 gray in five fractions. If you go back to the meta-analysis published by Jackson with over 6,000 patients, about this, the dose chosen for this study was higher than about 90% of the patients treated on the systematic review and meta-analysis that reported relatively low toxicity. And in addition to choosing 40 gray as the recommended dose for the entire study, they also allowed the investigators to use even higher doses at their discretion they could give a simultaneous integrated boost to the dominant intraprostatic lesion to 42 gray in five fractions. And they also could boost a pelvic lymph node area if they thought it was involved. Now, the reason this becomes a problem is that as I'll show you on the next slide, there were more high-risk patients on the CT arm with more uh, with a higher absolute number of risk factors likely to impact toxicity that favored the MR arm. So when they randomized the patients, they did not stratify by whether they were high risk or very high risk. They did not stratify by whether they used spacer or not. They did not stratify by whether they had difference in baseline GI comorbidity. And so if you look at the patients that were on the CT arm, 39 versus 25, fewer of them had spacer. GI comorbidity uh, pre-treatment was 23 versus 15. So if you add up all of these factors, so you had 77 patients who had 93 factors, which I would argue could be associated with increase in toxicity versus 74 out of 79. So this implies maybe the patients that were on the CT group that had slightly more toxicity were worse patients to start out with. But not only that, let's look at, this is, a, this is observer bias in randomized trials with measurement scale outcomes. This is a systematic review of trials with both blinded and unblinded assessors. So they had 16 trials that include over 2,800 patients. And what they found was that unblinded assessors tended to exaggerate the pooled effect size by 68. So being unblinded, doing an unblinded study tends to bias the observers to, to give higher value. So this is from the study showing that basically suggesting it's dangerous to do unblinded studies and, and, and you're liable to get spurious results. In addition to that, you should be aware that studies that have compared patient reported side effects versus physician reported side effects show that usually the patient says they have more side effects than the doctor says. So the patient ones are orange and the doctor's in blue. So generally speaking, you ask the, the, if you ask the, the doctor, how is my patient doing? You, the doctor says, my patient is doing great. He doesn't have any side effects. And then you ask the patient, the patient says, yeah, I'm having side effects. So physicians tend to underreport toxicity. That's in general, that's typical. 
from most studies. However, on this Mirage trial, the top table is, is from the, from the uh, supplementary material provided. This is looking at G, G, CT guided versus MR guided. This is greater than or equal to two urinary toxicity. The physician said it was 42.7 versus 25.3. It was highly statistically significant. But the patients, when you ask them looking at urinary irritative obstructive score at zero, one, and three months, there was no difference. So in this particular study, which was unblinded, where the physicians were convinced themselves that MR guidance was likely to be better. That's why they used two millimeter margins. In the first place, they reported higher toxicity than the patients reported. That's a concern. Going back to this concept of placebo effect, even the patients, so the patients knew they were getting MR too. This is a study looking at patients who had seizure disorder. So they were randomized to either an effective drug or a placebo. And overall, about 13% of patients were convinced they had a greater than 50% reduction in their seizures with placebo. So if you could convince a patient, so if a patient knows they got an MRI treatment and they knows the MRI treatment was two millimeters, I believe they would be biased toward believing that their side effects were less. And the ones that got the CT with four millimeters might be biased to think their side effects were more. That's a problem. So my conclusions concerning the Mirage trial are number one, flawed design. The doses were higher than, than in the literature, but that wasn't justified. The margins were arbitrary and complicate the analysis. There's a lack of motion adjustment data. We don't know how often they move the MR, how did they need to move it? There's also questions about inter-observer variability and defining how accurately you can determine whether 10% of the prostate is displaced or not. Excuse me, that this is really fiducial guidance, guidance rather than CT guidance. There's a potential for observer bias. There's potential for placebo effect. There's no clinical outcome data. And clearly the costs are, are going to be greater to have an MR machine, MR LINAC versus a regular LINAC. The, the, Dr. Roach, before, before we go for this next poll. Uh -huh. uh, I'm just going to ask, this is a question that's coming up. So let me ask the question and then and then I'll take the other question. So this is, okay, which perfect. of the following statements is not true concerning prostate SVRT? The fiducial markers have been shown to, I'm going to read anyway, just because I can, for, to remind myself, been shown to improve the accuracy of IGRT performed daily. Rectal distension at the time of simulation has been shown to be associated with a higher incidence of uh, toxicity. MR guidance has been proven to reduce the toxicity of SBRT. Placebo effects have been shown to result in rates of response rates of 13 to 60 percent. And retrospective studies have shown that SBRT as a boost appears to result to, to comparable outcomes to HDR. So which of those is not true? Which of those is false? We're at only 11%. Okay. Si logro para que les aparezca a todos, la idea es que todos puedan participar. Recuerden que va a aparecer en su pantalla principal. Ahí deberían estarlo viendo. Ya tenemos 119 participantes, 127, 34%. Pero, pero está aumentando. La pregunta es cuál es falsa respecto a la radiocirugía de próstata. Well, the, the, as the votes are coming in, the, 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 the percentage of accurate have gone up. Okay. All right. Well, why don't we stop here? So the, 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 the results are 35% of people got the right answer, which is the good news. MR guidance has been proven to reduce the, uh, the toxicity. That's my opinion. I would say, no, it has not been proven because it wasn't, it was 
it's been shown that if you, it's the data suggests that if you treat people with a four millimeter margin versus a two millimeter margin, there more be there may be more side effects. It doesn't mean that MR reduces the side effects compared to anything because you can explain the difference by the margin. So I would say that's a false statement. The use of fiducial markers have been shown to improve the accuracy of IGRT. We did a study, we compared that versus BAT. The study that Pat Capellian did with cone beam CT showed that it was off. I mean, it's pretty clear that you can use fiducials. We use fiducials to guide IGRT. The rectal distension question has two pieces. The rectal extension is true, because it reduced the toxicity, but it increased the failure rate. So because you were missing the back of the prostate. So that part is true. It has been shown to have a higher biochemical failure rate. Placebo effects are been shown 13 to 60%. So that's true. I showed you the example of the pink pills versus the blue pills. And the study look, studies looking at seizure disorders. And we did in fact compare SBRT uh, versus HDR and UCSF and other people have done it as well. It looked like the results are comparable for, for uh, patients that uh, are, are with high-risk disease. Dr. Roach, before we go to conclusion, uh, okay. we have two, two more questions. Uh, okay. what, is, what do you think about if a patient has intraprostatic calcifications? Do you think that's enough or do you still want to go for the fiducials? The calcification, so the calcium, the calcifications are not as dense as a gold seed. And you want a very dense plus you need the if you have a you know, if you there, I have seen patients in my career that probably could have been guided by calcium, but I still put in markers because it's very unusual. They may not have three. I mean, ideally you want at least three seeds. You can do it with two seeds if you take off your rotation, uh, but rarely are you going to have two calcifications that are far enough apart or three calcifications that are far enough apart to allow you to do adjustments for rotations and stuff like that. So I don't think that calcium calcifications alone, uh, same thing is true in post-op patients. I don't think that surgical clips Surgical clips and even brachytherapy seeds. When we do salvage SBRT, I still have gold marker seeds put in. If they don't have them from the brachy, you usually when we do LDR brachy, we put a gold seed at the apex in the base. But if I'm going to do salvage, let's say they have a recurrence in one lobe because there was a cold spot there, I'll have an additional gold seed added so that I can have three seeds so I can do all the rotations that I want. Okay, that's great. Also, someone is asking, what about treating pelvic lymph nodes with SBRT? Do you still use your formula to calculate risk of lymph node disease? And what do you think about treating the lymph yeah. node with so, SBRT? So if I have a patient that has PET positive disease on, let's say I get them staged and they have PET positive disease on PSMA PET, a positive node, I treat the whole pelvis, the common iliacs, and, and some of the periodic nodes with conventional fractionation, 1.8, but I concurrently do a, a simultaneous integrated boost to treat the PET positive node. I give 60 gray in 25 fractions. So I give them 25 fractions. They get 45 to the rest of the pelvis where I don't have any evidence of disease. And I actually treat the node to 60 gray in 25 fractions. So I don't, I don't, I only do isolated SBRT for nodal metastases if the patient has had prior whole pelvic radiation and I can't retreat the pelvis again. Otherwise, if you treat just the, the oligometastasis with SBRT, they tend to recur in the immediate adjacent area. And you'll be chasing them over and over again, and they'll pop up with new disease. And also, they still need to have hormone therapy given when you treat the pelvic lymph nodes. So I don't just do SBRT alone. Is there another question? Uh -huh. Well, we have uh, another extra question for the pool. Uh, 
it's a surprise. <laughs> it was just done for Ben during the class. Uh, it will be now in your screen. The question is, eh, para el, el uso de marcadores e IGRT, si lo usan con, con TAC o resonancia. It's, it's a question about to you know what is doing the people in the audience. The, the first one is, is people using for SBRT e CT and fiducials. So we'll see what happens. Oh, I see. You're asking them a question. How many people use fiducial? Yes, yes. We are okay. using that question. So we don't use SBRT or are you seeing CT for a year T or are you seeing? Oh, I see. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's then, an interesting. Yeah. So, uh, you know, these terms are artificial in many ways because the only difference between SBRT and IMRT is how accurately and precisely the margins are being used to treat the target and changing the size of the fraction, but it's still the same technology. When you use a linear accelerator to do SBRT 950 times four, that's the same technology that you use for IMRT for prostate only that we used to use to give 40 treatments. So the only real difference is we're calling it something different because we're trying harder to make sure that the margins are smaller and that the dose is higher. But really it's the same thing. So if you have IMRT at your center, then you could have SBRT at your center if you can incorporate a image-guided component to it then you can do SBRT. It's not different technology fundamentally than IMRT. That, that's a that's great opinion because as you see, 36% of people here in the audience, they are not using SBRT yet at their center. And the other 35%, they don't use fiducials, but they use CT scan for IGRT. And then there's just few who are using fiducials and CT scan. Yeah. So I think that using CT for SBRT is better than using nothing. Um, I think that it's going to be a little bit. And so, you know, maybe if we did a study, it would be unethical to do a randomized trial where you guarantee that you accurately treat the prostate every day versus using CT alone where you know that the accuracy is not there. I think that if I was a patient, now of course, maybe at your institution if it's challenging or complicated maybe it would be ethical to do a randomized trial but at my institution i would feel it would be unethical for me i can easily get gold seeds i know i can treat the patient within one or two millimeters of accuracy and to tell them well i don't you don't need a ct i'm just going to do uh, i don't i don't need the fiducials we're just going to do cone beam then you're turning him over to the therapist and the therapist is looking at a CT image and they're picking it. Now, when they, every day after each patient is treated, the therapist actually send me an image of the treatment showing how the seeds were lined up to prove that they localized. So that means that they know that I'm looking at those images every day as opposed to in the old days, many years ago when I had still had hair and I was young, we used to take a film once a week. It was called a port film. And it was based on the bony anatomy. We would look at whether the ISO center of the image was lined up to the bones appropriately. Well, first of all, that was after the fact. The patient had already been treated and sometimes I would look at the image and say, oh, it was off. And I would tell them to move it. And then they would move it and take another film. So once a week. 
my patients would tell me, Dr. Roach, how come on the days that they take those images, they spend a lot of time lining me up, but on the other days they don't. So you have, so one of the advantages of using fiducial markers is you have a guarantee every day that you've captured each one of those images and those seeds are lined up and they are superimposed between the digitally reconstructed radiograph and the treatment of that day. I don't think you can get that accuracy with cone beam CT. Thank you, Dr. Roach. You, you can continue. Okay. So higher doses yield better PSA controls, but you have to consider the risk benefit ratio. They also render more toxicity and they haven't been shown to improve survival. People choose radiotherapy based on their expertise, their patient preference, and the technology they have available. So if you don't have SBRT and you don't have anybody that's going to put in fiducials for you and the technology that you have is fairly limited, you only have 3D, it's going to be a little tricky and challenging to do SBRT. But SBRT is ready for prime time. It is used every day in my practice, and if used properly, uh, it's very safe and effective, but the devil is in the details. You must understand prostate anatomy. I did a series of lectures for the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy. They were pub posted years ago. There are other places, but you must understand how the bladder deck comes in, how it looks from different angles, where the bulb of the penis is, how to define the urethra, where the external sphincter is, all of those things. You also have to have some idea about the dose constraints that you want to use to those targets and uh, know precisely where the target is located. This is why you need image guidance. And I think fiducials are extremely important. I would rather be treated with 3D with fiducials and image guidance than SBRT with no, with no fiducials and guidance. So I'm going to close with this last slide. Not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. That's what Einstein said. Not everything that counts can be counted. That is, not everything that's important can be counted. And not everything that can be counted counts. The fact that you can Count something doesn't make it important, right? But I say you have to count what you can count and hope that it counts. You have to take advantage of the information that you have available and then hope that you can use that information in a meaningful way. So I've talked about the, the criticisms of MR guidance. I've talked about the criticism of the use of spacer. And I've talked about the opportunities associated with the use of fiducial markers. I'm sure the vendors are probably not happy about how I talked about their, their products, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think the best thing for patients is to know where the prostate's located every day prior to each treatment and treat it accurately. Thank you for your attention, and I'll take questions. Thank you, Dr. Roche. That was a huge lecture, as always. Thank you so much for being with us. Okay, we will open. Maybe we can do some questions still. We'll see here. I know, Ben, Maddie, do you have any other questions? Well, I do have a question for you. And I see that you use the four fractionation schedules, but seeing the answers from the participants, you know, only 40% 40 per, 40 of the participants are not yet using SBRT, would you recommend if you're just starting to use SBRT at your center using the four fractionation regimen or would you go with five fractions? Well, we use both. So if the patient is elderly and frail, if they've had a prior TERP, if there's something about their anatomy where they have so I didn't go into some of the weeds of how we do this. My, my physicists have published something called an EIV, which has to deal with sort of the geometry of how much rectum and how much bladder is going to be in the field when you do SVRT. 
and we set some constraints. If the EIV is a high number, so if they have a really big prostate, then I'm more likely to do the, the five fraction regimen. I think the five, the toxicity of the five fraction is a little bit milder. And one of the reasons I became more enthusiastic about it is there was a study done in Canada where they compared radiation once a week. And it turned out that uh, initially I was concerned that they had a higher failure rate, but with longer follow-up, they're not reporting a higher failure rate, but they're, they're reporting a reduction in toxicity. And it was actually Chris King, who was one of the first people that made the observation when he was doing SBRT at Stanford, that having a break was associated with uh, less toxicity. So this was just an anecdotal observation. So in some cases, the patient is coming from great distance. They're young. They have a small prostate. Their anatomy is very favorable. Getting them done in one week is really a good thing for them. Monday, Tuesday, skip Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, done. In other cases, the patient lives very close. They don't really care. They're older. They're already getting up a lot at night to pee. It doesn't matter. One extra treatment is no big deal. So, and they have a big prostate. Then I might go Monday, every other day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, and be done. So uh, I use both of them depending upon the circumstances. I prefer the shorter course. It does. So people talk about dose escalation in the trial that, that Dr. Keyshawn had of MRI guidance versus CT guidance, where they use 40 gray and five fractions. Well, if they really wanted to dose escalate, to use a higher, you know, biologic effective dose, 950 times four is actually a higher dose biologically than 40 gray and five fractions. But so it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. But I like the, so my standard for a favorable intermediate risk patient who I'm just, you know, who's got good anatomy is four fractions. But if they have problems, I go at five. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Roche, so, someone asked in the chat about the use of PET, the PSMA PET for patients. Well, what about the use? So I order, so the patients that I order a PSMA PET, all patients that have unfavorable intermediate risk or high risk, I get a PSMA PET. If they have favorable intermediate risk or low risk, I don't do a PET. And if the PET is positive in the pelvic nodes, I do a simultaneous integrated boost to boost that PET positive node to 60 gray and five fractions with whole pelvic radiation. If the pet is if the pet shows no evidence of nodal disease and the patient is reasonably favorable, un, is, let's say they're unfavorable intermediate risk, but it's not too bad. Sometimes I will just treat the prostate. I will not treat the pelvic lymph nodes, but I will give them a short course of four months of hormone therapy after the radiation rather than before the radiation. Because of the study, because of our data showing hormones afterwards is better than hormones before when you do prostate only radiation. That's great, Dr. Roger. I think with that, uh, we finish questions.